This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by StarCore Sessions, happening in Tel Aviv on September 16th. Broaden your knowledge of zero-knowledge proofs with highly technical sessions from some of the industry's leading experts. Register at epicenter.rocks slash Starkware and receive 20% off the regular ticket price with the code EPICENTER. And by Trail of Bits. Don't leave your project's security audit to just any firm. Trust a team with decades of experience at the forefront of blockchain security research. Go to trailofbits.com to learn more. And by Valturo, the gold hedging platform for the crypto community. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely starting at just one milligram. Go to valturo.gold slash epicenter to get early access to their V2 platform and to start trading. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. Epicenter is a show that interviews crypto entrepreneurs, academics and business people in the cryptocurrency space. I am Meher Roy and with me is Friederike Ernst. So Frederica and I are going to chat with Igor Baranov, who is the tech lead for the POA network. Now the POA network, I feel is one of those projects that challenges a lot of conventional wisdom on how crypto networks and proof of stake networks in particular should be built. What's your opinion of it, Frederica? Oh, it's super interesting. So uh, we are trained to think of um, centralization and dependence on individual actors as something bad, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, So it was super interesting to hear Igor's points on this. Yeah, so it's essentially this consensus algorithm where all of the validators are US notaries and their identity is known. And it has a very unique economic system, very unique governance system. I mean, if you look at it from a game theory perspective, probably you're not going to find it very sound. You can have various critiques of it. Certainly, I I was getting a lot of critiques in my mind. But the reason we felt this made an interesting episode is, at least for me, the lens of game theory is, is an interesting lens. But sometimes human behavior is actually different from what what your mathematical model of the game is going to predict. And and then you need experimental data. You need experimental economies putting people in situations to see how they actually behave. And I feel from that perspective, it's it's amazing that like a project is doing an experiment like that. What if you made like notaries the validators and you wrote the proof of stake game that way? I feel like they can be very valuable data that comes out of an experiment on how humans actually behave when they are given a position of responsibility in in, in, in in that kind of way. So without much further ado, we give you the interview with Igor. Hi, Igor. Thanks for being here today. Um, so uh, to start things off, um, can you tell us what your background is and how you got into blockchain? Um, hi, hi, my name is Igor. I'm tech lead of uh, POA Network. Uh, my background, uh, I have education in computer science. Uh, I worked all my life in uh, in IT. Uh, most of the time, I worked uh, in uh, enterprise uh, in uh, uh, mobile op- uh, operators. I, I got interested uh, with blockchain with uh, Bitcoin, um, and uh, cannot stop since then. It's quite easy, right? And from Bitcoin to Ethereum, and from Ethereum, I decided to stay with Ethereum for a while um, because it's uh, I think the the most exciting development uh, that we have for the last four years. What was it that caught your interest in Bitcoin? Uh, Before Bitcoin, uh, uh, we participated uh, as a team in uh, distributed protocols. Uh, If you you remember, there's a Boeing uh, where, you know, Sati at home and uh, some other uh, distributed uh, uh, data uh, processing um, uh, algorithms and uh, we participated in this and when I first time heard about uh, you know peer-to-peer electronic cash system I got excited and actually what we are doing now with our XDI development is uh, bringing this uh, electronic peer-to-peer cash system uh, for like real world application with uh, like required speed and uh, transaction price uh, and uh, programmability which is very important uh, for for electronic money Right. So that's uh, the the idea is uh, even then you don't understand it uh, when you understand that money can be uh, uh, free and uh, uh, yeah that's that's very exciting. So that, that's how I started. 
um, it, it was quite hard to get, uh, uh, let's say, a job uh, with uh, <laughs> before before Ethereum time in, in, in blockchain space. So I worked with uh, uh, multiple blockchain companies and participated in like all hackathons, even before you know, blockchain hackathon were like uh, uh, a term, right? Like just you just come to to a hackathon and you explain what blockchain is to judges, and uh, and after. Um, uh, you, you build something and show it, it to them. Uh, and, and, and after I worked uh, as a consultant for a Singaporean company called Acronis, built some, let's say, smart contracts uh, and uh, tools around them, uh, which after, and after this consulting, I started POA and so working with POA since then. You started working with POA from the get-go, so you're one of the founders, but you don't, you don't call yourself that. You call yourself um, the tech lead. Why is that? Uh, we don't ourselves founders and co-founders, and you know, we don't have C titles. Uh, it's a it's it's a it's a form of organization. We decided that uh, uh, all of us are like contractors contractors uh, uh, to the network and to the protocol. We had some like initial roadmap and white paper and ideas about uh, like how to make Ethereum protocol you know scalable this way. Right, and how to build um, tools which are like not available for uh, for this type of protocols, and we decided that we contribute our resources towards this um, idea. And uh, when you work in you know in, in open source uh, uh, field, it's easy to be um, like developer and to be uh, a builder than to be like CEO and and so forth. Right. So we're not selling our products. We don't have this, you know, commercial department, uh, business development, and so forth. Um, yeah, so that's why we, we don't have like C titles. Um, technically, there are some C titles because it's required by, by regulation uh, for, for, some, for some operations, but we don't use them, not internally, not externally. And we have quite a flat structure within the team. So do you have like a corporation that's actually building the things or... Is it just the DAO? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's quite a common legal structure when there is a, a foundation which holds some crypto assets and the operational company which is building stuff and not not even one operational company, multiple operational companies uh, and external partners. And um, technically, uh, it 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 works in in, in legal field and uh, that's right. There are some companies we're not operating only as DAO because it's quite hard. Let's say to pay AWS bills, right? With uh, as a DAO, you have to have a company to pay from. Uh, the same with uh, you know with uh, people and uh, other expenses. I get why you're why you don't have a CEO, a CEO, or you know other C titles towards the outside. Um, but how does the governance inside POA actually work? Because someone actually has to decide which direction to march in, right? Yeah, we have a, we have a two fund managers who decide how to spend uh, uh, funds, and uh, depends on the uh, on the situation. Let's say four to five uh, team leads, and uh, we have a consensus uh, team. We have Black Scout, which is our open source blockchain explorer team. Uh, we have a token bridge team, and uh, um, like DApps and uh, all all other tooling, right? So we have uh, like four team leads, and the uh, team leads are. Um, uh, Working with uh, like external and internal resources, but we we all contractors uh, for this for this project, right? So we don't have like okay, he, these people are employee, and you know these are contractors, and these like external contractors. We all decided that we're all contractors, but with like some different decision making uh, abilities and uh, in, in different fields. This is very interesting. But before we go deep down into how the governance of the network works, could you just tell us? What does the POA network do? And you have another network, which is the XDAI network. What does that network do? And what's the vision for each of them? Yeah, uh, it, uh, you know, it's changing from, like, from, from time when we originally thought about this idea. Um, if you remember the, like, the uh, April Fool's Day post by Ethereum Foundation, uh, written by Vitalik, uh, um, when he he said that uh, Ethereum mainnet is migrating to you know POA consensus, uh, he said this back in days, uh, uh, and it was joke, right? And the first time when we um, like discussed uh, a public permissioned network with real value, 
uh, based on Ethereum protocol, people thought like it's uh, you know it's stupid to make, right? First of all, it's uh, you know, centralized, which is uh, uh, a strong argument. It's it's hard to argue about it. Uh, second is that it's not secure, right? It, uh, because proof of work secure, and other, especially with you know this uh, uh, type of consensus uh, with uh, like uh, exclusive group of validators are like not secure at all. So that's what people think, right? It's not what I think. Um, so it was uh, it, it started as an experiment. Like, why do we need this experiment uh, to make the protocol, which is like Ethereum protocol, more accessible to people and let people experiment with this protocol? Uh, for for their own needs, right? POA network basically had different uh, consensus algorithm, different set of validators, different reward structure, but the same basic client, right? Without any uh, hardcore changes uh, in the uh, for 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 developers. So it's quite easy to jump from network to network, right? Uh, and the the XDAI is a if we think about this, it's a, it's 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 very new experiment. Uh, because this network is uh, actually the, the first um, stable chain, uh, the chain with a stable native token without uh, any like, uh, initial emission, without any supply of this uh, stable token. So all tokens on all native tokens of the, on this network are bridged from, from mainnet to XDAI. So it's a new concept. The theoretical concept of hard spoons are known for, 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 for a couple of years, but XDAI is the first um, hard spoon with, uh, with a stable token, which is not competing with Ethereum, right? Because uh, the stable token home is on Ethereum. So that's, uh, that's kind of experiment that we made within this XDAI network, and you know people love to use it. Uh, I think that it's, uh, it was not possible out within the Ethereum mainnet network and setting so we had to have we had to make it somewhere outside right so that's uh, that's that's the main reason uh, to exist and besides uh, building networks it's it's important to build tooling if we think about uh, ethereum ecosystem some tools are not available for for side chains and forks before it was like infura which was not available it's still you know supporting only mainnet and test nets and uh, either scan which is not supporting uh, competing networks uh, and metamask Right, like three, uh, three very important tools for developers, not supporting uh, uh, competing projects. Let's say, right. Um, so th that's that's why we decided to to spend our resources uh, to to build at least uh, uh, one tool. And uh, our blockchain explorer we hosted for uh, for twelve networks, and there are around twenty networks uh, using this uh, uh, blockchain explorer. So that's our contribution to the ecosystem, and we like Ethereum ecosystem, and we, you know we uh, we basically staying here and building tools which can be used on mainnet, can be used on side chains. That's a that's the idea of uh, of POA as a protocol, right? Allow people to experiment, build tools, uh, and uh, make this protocol you know scalable. Scal scalability nowadays is not that important like it was two years ago, right? Because uh, Two years ago, like everyone thought, okay, what are we going to do with crypto kitties uh, and, and so forth? Now people are asking less about uh, scalability and more about use cases. And this, you know, the questions are changing from year to year, right? Starkware is organizing the Starkware Sessions Conference during the Tel Aviv Blockchain Week in September, and you should definitely consider going. In case you don't know about Starkware, they're productizing zero-knowledge proofs to solve two of the blockchain ecosystem's most pressing issues scalability, and privacy. And Starkware is co-founded by Eli Ben Sassoon, who was previously on the show. The conference will cover some of the most cutting-edge research and applications in the field of zero-knowledge proofs. And you can expect only the brightest minds in the space to discuss things like self-custodial trading, Starks for Layer 1, Stark-friendly hash functions, and other cool things you can do with Stark proofs. Many of the speakers are Epicenter alumni, including Ethereum researchers Vitalik Buterin, Alexei Akunov, and Justin Drake. Martin Kopelman of Gnosis will also be speaking, as well as Arthur Brightman of Tezos. So if you're interested in broadening your understanding of these cutting edge technologies, there's no better place to do it than Starkware Sessions. Join the conference in Tel Aviv on September 16th, or come a day early for the Stark 101 workshop where you'll build a Stark Prover from scratch. Tickets are on sale now, and you can find the registration page at epicenter.rocks Starkware. That's S-T-A-R-K-W-A-R-E. The first 50 people to use the code Epicenter will get 20% off the regular ticket price. We'd like to thank Starkware Sessions for their support of Epicenter. So let's talk about the POA network first. 
It's a proof of authority network. So there's a number of validators in this network. Um, how, how does one become validator in this network? Yeah, we, we, we slightly renamed it. We call it proof of autonomy because we think that uh, it's a network based on DAO. Like it's, a, it's exclusive DAO by validators and exclusive means that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a limited group of, of people who can make decisions within this DAO and, uh, and they can um, uh, let new validators in uh, on, or they can let out validators on the network, right? So the, um, the each POA network starts from a trusted ceremony. So there is a bootstrapping of this network, and we have a special role called Master of Ceremonies. So this role, uh, bootstrapping new network and uh, onboard uh, uh, minimum required number of validators uh, who will onboard new validators through the governance process, right? So POA network started with uh, one Master of Ceremonies and uh, three first validators. After that, validators uh, uh, received a, a, a governance uh, instrument, which we call voting tab, where they can propose uh, uh, ballots and each validator can propose ballot to add or remove a validator from the network. And there is a quorum decision by, by other validators with uh, equal votes um, to onboard uh, um, new validators. So to be a new validator, usually validators apply um, on the forum or they can apply on some, some, some uh, probably apply somewhere else. Uh, but the, uh, how, how it started, they apply with their application uh, and there are some requirements. And there are some requirements which limit the uh, uh, number of uh, uh, subset of potential validators from the subset of all people. Uh, but you know, the, the subset which can be validators is quite big. And yeah, it's, uh, it, it's also interesting that uh, uh, validators of POA are individuals. And the, it's, as far as I know, it's the only network which is uh, managed only by individuals, not companies. If you look into any other you know, proof of stake or POA consensus, it's usually it's a form of consortiums of, uh, uh, of companies or financial organizations or uh, some. If in proof of stake, it's, it's more likely like professional, um, uh, professional companies which are providing this, uh, you know, staking services, basically, right? Uh, and POA is, uh, is a network managed only by individuals. Like, there, is, there are no companies out there. So what happens if a validator misbehaves? What, what happens if they act maliciously? Can, can, um, do they have to stake some funds that can then be slashed? Or how do you, how do you make sure that they behave in a way that benefits the network at, as a whole? Yeah, we think that uh, well, the, there is a way uh, for for uh, for other validators to remove validator from from the consensus. So any validator can propose a ballot to remove a validator from the consensus. Usually, misbehaving uh, in uh, in POE is uh, when validator is uh, for 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 some reason uh, is not running uh, his or her node, right? So that's like that's a common misbehaving that we that we saw during these two years. Uh, then, for example, they forgot to pay for, for the bill or because of the uh, misconfiguration, let's say, uh, uh, parameters of their node is too low and so forth, right? So validators can vote out um, a validator and we had uh, multiple uh, examples um, uh, when validators voted out other validators. That's, um, uh, but the good thing here is that uh, uh, the, the consensus can tolerate a right, uh, number of uh, faulty nodes uh, and uh, even if, if one validator is, uh, well, if one validator is misbehaving, it's not a problem, right? Because the consensus is uh, fault tolerant. Yeah, validators have this governance uh, application. And this application is a part of the consensus. So it it's runs within a uh, smart contract and smart contract is connected to the consensus layer. And I, I, I read that validators, in order to be a validator, you have to be a US notary. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's uh, that's right, and uh, and some people ask like why, right? And uh, like, do you want to ask why, or like any other questions regarding uh, notaries? Yeah, yeah. Why why U.S. notaries? Why specifically that? Okay, so why why the U.S. notaries? Uh, because uh, first uh, um, first of all, it's it's a, it's a, it's it's a great way of making uh, KYC on validators, right? We when we think about individuals. What is the best way to, to get KYC, right? When people apply to be U.S. notary government, it's a U.S. government uh, on state level, 
is making uh, KYC checks uh, on uh, on applicants, uh, and results of these checks are publicly available, right? So also validators are taking some public responsibilities, provide services, and they cannot uh, uh, they cannot decline providing their identity to any third party who is interested in you know, cross-validating identity, right? If you ask, uh, I don't know, a validator of any proof-of-stake network to confirm their identity, they can do this or not, right? Because it's on, like, for you as a, like a, as a concerned, uh, let's say, token holder. With, um, uh, with POA validators, you can ask to, to make a like, not really related document from this validator, and this way you can cross-validate their identity. Like you can actually ask them to notarize something for you. It's outside of the protocol, but you can this way you can cross-validate their identity. But also, the, uh, because uh, uh, validators are individuals, it's interesting to understand uh, you know, like what's, what's their background. Um, especially as, as a validator, I don't want to have uh, uh, other validators uh, from like some uh, like social groups. For example, I, I don't want to see um, criminals as validators, right? And when um, uh, notaries cannot be cannot have a pre previous uh, um, uh, criminal record, so that's also a good way to to, to prove. Uh, and and also, uh, notary law is regulated um, like state by state. So there is no organization in the U.S. which can say, okay, guys, you are notaries, you cannot do this, right? So it's, it's regulated state by state. And there is a diverse group of validators from different states, which is good for, uh, actually, it's good for decentralization, right, when we think about this. Well, when, when people are notaries, they already agree to share information about themselves, including their, um, like, residential address. Uh, in in public, so you can like you you can validate uh, residential addresses of, of all validators. Why the U.S. notaries? Because we th we thought that um, can be interesting uh, use case and uh, uh, for uh, for like U.S. based network. And till now, the the POA network is, as far as I know, it's the only U.S. based network, which is like all validators are U.S. based and it's public network with uh, like public. Uh, uh, token, it's uh, it's a good experiment. We thought that this type of network can be used with uh, some local specific use cases. For example, when if if uh, some local or federal authorities will be interested to put some information uh, on chain, uh, we thought that uh, the uh, POA based network can be an advantage. It didn't happen, right. but yeah, it, it can be. So so how did you find? a number of uh, computer-savvy technology-forward notaries who are interested in being a validator, and how do you incentivize them to be one? Yeah, that, uh, uh, with uh, first validators, it was quite, uh, quite hard, right? especially for the, the, the first one. So I presented in the, uh, on, um, on Ethereum meetups. Uh, I'm co-organizer of a Silicon Valley Ethereum meetup. So I presented over there. It's actually when I announced the project and a few validators uh, uh, applied to be a validator after my presentation on uh, Silicon Valley Ethereum meetup. Uh, and after I visited uh, conferences and meetups, and usually from, from one uh, presentation, uh, uh, we had like one candidate. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how it started. Uh, and, and after it was easier because, uh, you know, when the project received some, some hype and, uh, and also when the token uh, started to be like, traded publicly, validators had clear incentive. So we designed the protocol that the way that uh, each uh, each block, one coin is created, and uh, uh, this coin is going to a validator who created this block, right? So all validators are incentivized uh, by the protocol to make their, how we call it, uh, public duty by private actors, right? So they're private actors, but they're doing public duty by, you know, participating in this uh, uh, participating in this type of DAO, right? It's a it's it's exclusive DAO because uh, it's a limited group of validators, but it's still decentralized autonomous organization, and they're not. Uh, one one more thing with with individuals, it's 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 quite interesting that individuals um, they cannot buy each other, right? Like legally, companies can 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 form some you know uh, can buy shares of each other companies, they can exchange tokens and so forth, right? So individuals are atomic units. Validators agreed that they will not form, uh, they will not form relations, and uh, 
who had one validator and who invited uh, his uh, girlfriend to be a validator. But after they decided to be a family, uh, he stepped out and uh, now only she's a validator, which is quite cool, right? But she's keeping the, uh, the rules, like social rules. So they agreed not to form families between uh, validators uh, uh, like, or if a family is formed, like one of validators should quit or both. Let's talk about security. You know, dApps are pretty unique because unlike other types of software, they can hold astronomical amounts of value. That's why getting systems audited, creating robust security processes, and fostering a culture of security in your organization is so important. And to do this, you should only trust experts with real security expertise. There are a lot of security firms in the blockchain space, but few have the experience and track record of Trail of Bits. And they've been in business since 2012, long before things like the DAO hack were even imaginable. Trail of Bits works with your team to audit every aspect of your project. And smart contract code is just the beginning. They'll help you implement best practices around things like DevOps, key storage, and user-facing applications. And once your software has been rigorously tested and reviewed by Trail of Bits, they'll provide the tools you need to make sure that your code remains safe over every new commit. They can even put a software security expert at your team's disposal who'll give you advice and answer your questions when you need them. It's like having your own security engineer on staff, but don't take my word for it. Go to their publications repo on GitHub to read their papers, presentations, and security reviews. It's no wonder teams like Parity, Status, New Cipher, and organizations like Facebook and DARPA trust Trail of Bits for their security audits. To learn more, go to trailofbits.com, and if you decide to reach out, make sure you let them know you heard about them on Epicenter. We'd like to thank Trail of Bits for their support. In the US legal language, there is this concept of an unincorporated association or an unincorporated partnership. So this is like a collection of individuals that is doing some activity, but they have not incorporated in any of these legal structures like LLC, S Corp, C Corp, etc. The, the thing is like if you're an unincorporated partnership or association, and if there's ever a legal lawsuit against that association, then the members of that association are individually infinitely liable for if something goes wrong in that lawsuit. So wouldn't don't your validators worry that this kind of organization where there are identifiable individuals with their records accessible if if let's say there was a hack of the poa network and people lost a bunch of poa tokens or xdai tokens or whatever then all of these individuals are going to be legally liable for that event yeah uh, it's a it's a good question we we don't know about uh, lawsuit against this type of um, formations. Uh, I the, the first question I asked myself uh, when I started to design the protocol was like, is it even legal, right, uh, for for individuals to create their own basically tokens and protect uh, someone else's resources? And that was my first question, and uh, I asked lawyers. And I remember when I asked this question, my perception was like, I'm doing something wrong. Because I thought it, 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 it was not possible to do something like this. But they explained that um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's totally feasible and, uh, and uh, there, there are no legal risks. The same question was with, uh, with our uh, Bridges product, which can you know, allow individuals to transfer tokens between networks. Like, is it legal to transfer tokens or not? So validators can be, uh, can be legally binded to lawsuits uh, if like whatever they're doing is uh, uh, against, uh, uh, let's say, uh, token holders, right? If they like collude, technically it's possible. And from my perspective as a protocol designer, I think it's great, right? So it it, it what protects the this DAO, <laughs> with this DAO from colluding because they understand that they're publicly exposed persons and they 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 taking this uh, responsibility. I tried to call this uh, skin of the game. Right, they like they they didn't like it uh, that uh, I call the skin of the game. So we call it identity at stake. So like most of the validators, they already you know they 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 people with uh, you know their own like families uh, and uh, you know their own lives. They don't want to uh, risk this uh, like status quo, and they actually they they understand uh, what uh, they are doing and they agree on this. Uh, 
it's interesting that we have uh, uh, we have like we have different um, different uh, professions. Some people think like, oh, most likely all validators are U.S. U.S. notaries, but notary in the U.S. it's it's like a separate. Uh, uh, way of uh, it's 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 not it's not a job right for most people it's just like additional uh, source of uh, of revenue for for most people so the, the, there are different backgrounds uh, there are software engineers business owners and also there are lawyers right so lawyers they can they understand uh, 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 what uh, they are doing and uh, that uh, uh, I think that they understand what they're doing but theoretically they can face a lawsuit and uh, that's like a, a, anyone can can face a lawsuit. That's that's. Of course, of course, this is a question that is not specific for just POA. So, like a few months back, I was talking to one of the one of the large investors of of MakerDAO, right? Huge MKR holder, and they were talking about these designs of these committees. You know, like the stability fee committee and this fee committee and that fee committee, and. Committee members there are individuals and they have similar risks. Now, if you're in a committee and you jack up the stability fee and somebody like loses money because you jacked up the fee too high or too low, what protects you from a lawsuit there? Yeah, yeah, I understand totally. We worked with uh, with multiple lawyers on like on legal uh, opinions on on our products. Actually, it was good to see Stephen Pali here in on your uh, podcast. We were a client of him, uh, so that, uh, I understand that that's possible. I'm not a lawyer; I cannot guarantee you know anything to um, to people participating, and uh, it's uh, it's possible that I made a, a mistake while when I designed the protocol, and we had validators had many questions. For example, like how to make you know they're they're all Americans, right? They all. Uh, well, not all Americans, all uh, U.S. residents, because you, you can be a uh, notary in the U.S. without being American. So we have a uh, few Canadians and uh, uh, and uh, one uh, Russian citizen, but they're U.S. notaries and they they participate in the consensus. So the question is like how to how to tax uh, revenue from the from the consensus, right? And in, in some networks, some people don't care because they have some you know Cayman entity and uh, they don't care. But here. All validators are exposed, right? And uh, it, it was a question, and uh, they had uh, long discussions about this. And uh, well, tax season ended, so I hope uh, like <laughs> validators, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, made, made it right. And would you want to extend? So right now, only U.S. notaries can be validators, but in principle, you could allow German notaries to be validators as well. And would you want to extend this geographically or will keep it limited to the US? Uh, right. So uh, the idea of side chains is that uh, we can, if we think about scalability, right? And scalability not only about transactions per second, but also about uh, like use cases and uh, roadmap of the network, we can we can we can extend it vertically, right? So we can we can think, okay, so US validators is like not enough. Let let's add you know some some other jurisdictions. With uh, their own problems, you know. Let's add some European validators with a GDPR right, uh, regulation, or we can we can we can make horizontal scaling, and we can say, yeah, the, this model is interesting in the U.S., but let's have a network with you know European validators and so forth. So that was our like first uh, idea about uh, like validator set, and I think that uh, uh, POE validator set is unique, and it's it, it's good to keep it as it is, right? Like U.S.-based network. Uh, with uh, uh, this uh, notaries as validators, and if you want to experiment, we can start a new network with a new set of validators. With uh, XDAI, we started with network with uh, basically with MakerDAO, right? Like with two validators, uh, PO and MakerDAO. Now we have ten validators, you know, different companies, organizations from different countries, no individuals at all. Like all members are um, organizations. Uh, some of them are DAO, like Meta Cartel uh, or Giveth, right? Some of them are companies uh, like POA, some, or, you know, and and so forth. So that that's the way, right? So if you want to to have the same consensus but with different set of validators, we can launch one more network. And there are multiple networks launched or planned to launch on the same consensus and governance model, like Ocean Protocol, Luxo, Luxo, uh, Artist Network from Austria. 
uh, yeah, several networks launched on the same uh, ideas, and the uh, the validator set is, is different. And also they they experiment. For example, Artis network, they have validators uh, with like the same governance structure, but validators should put a bond, right? It's not staking. They have should put a bond. If they put a bond, they can be a validator, can be onboarded by other validators, which is which is quite cool, right? Because it creates a uh, uh, some uh, locking mechanism within the token economy, which is good for uh, for token holders. So what all of these networks have in common is the consensus mechanism. Can you explain how that works? The consensus of PoE? Yes. Well, the, the main idea is that uh, uh, there, is a, there is a set of validators which is managed by, by, by smart contracts, by a DAO, right? And this, uh, uh, this is known as a Zeebel protection mechanism, right? Because if we, uh, if we understand uh, who validators are and why they can create block, we can understand if the network is uh, operating uh, under some assumptions of uh, uh, like Zeebel protection. For example, in proof of work, right? If you have more power, uh, you're a validator right, for this block. Uh, and uh, well, more power and you're lucky to create a block, right? In, in, in proof of stake, there's a set of uh, stakers who, who have more coins than, uh, than, than, than any other people from the subset. Uh, uh, in delegated proof of stake, there is this um, set of people more tokens than anyone anyone else staked, and also there is a delegation people who delegated. Right in POA, there is a set of people who are selected by subset of this set, uh, and um, the whole set can manage this uh, uh, set by excluding uh, validators or including them based on uh, DAO decision. Right, so the 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 governance uh, is based on DAO, and on the the main question validators uh, is. Uh, um, deciding on is who are validators. So this is a part of uh, Zebel control. So second important part is uh, reward distribution. The protocol distributes, uh, distributes reward to validators. It's, it's embedded within the protocol. And validators uh, also have uh, what we call self-sustainability emission. So some emission they can spend uh, on, the, uh, on the protocol um, to support R&D and, and so forth. Right. The, the underlying BFT consensus can be swapped. For, the now, for now, we're using uh, Aura consensus, uh, uh, which is developed by Parity Technologies. Uh, and uh, we plan to migrate to, to a new censorship-resistant consensus uh, in 2020. So that's our plan. Uh, well, it's a it's quite, quite easy thing because uh, uh, when, when, we, when we think, like, what is more important, what is the most important for pure consensus, is the answer to the question who validators are and like why validators are these keys, right? Because they were voted in by other validators. And when you upgrade the network, say when you switch to um, the Honey Badger uh, protocol next year, um, will all validators actually have to agree with this upgrade or how do you follow through on this? Once a year, we have a security incident which can be like incident type of like consensus fault. So we have to upgrade protocols. It's because some like problems within implementation of, let's say, parity client uh, or some bugs in Ethereum protocol, which can cause these uh, problems. So at least once a year, we have to to propose like <laughs> updates to validators, and they have to agree on this. Um, so this type of upgrades are usually uh, proposed in, like in, a, in emergency form. So for validators, it's uh, they don't have much time to think about it, right? Most of the time, the upgrades are, are proposed for the test network, and after the test network, they, they propose to the, um, to the POE main network uh, in the form of uh, hard forks uh, or protocol upgrades. So validators, uh, some of them have uh, um, uh, software engineering background. We have validators working on you know, Amazon, Facebook, uh, and some, some other companies. They can review some, some changes and agree on these changes or not, right? If we propose upgrade of the uh, of the bug and the consensus, which is known, they will upgrade it. But let's say if we propose, I don't know, switching from POA to DPoS, it will be very different uh, discussion. Right? So most likely they will ask many questions, and uh, uh, I, I don't know outcomes of this uh, 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 decision by validators. That's that's not my network, right? That's their network. Sure. Can can anyone propose changes, or who has the power to propose changes to the to the protocol? 
Technically, yeah, anyone can propose changes. So anyone can 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 make a PR and or validators themselves can 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 make uh, their own changes. The um, this Zebel control and reward distribution part is uh, uh, supports upgradability through smart contracts. So implementation can be uploaded to anyone in the form of a uh, like smart contract, right? Uh, and validators can vote to replace uh, this. Uh, new implementation, like old implementation to new implementation using on-chain voting without any, like, without asking anyone, right? Like any validator can propose a change to the whole consensus with uh, the upgradability of the, of the consensus and also with upgradability of the client. So technically they can replace the, um, everything. They can do it for, for good or for bad. If you're holding a significant portion of your net worth in crypto, you're probably waiting for your portfolio to moon at any time. But holding crypto doesn't mean you should be irresponsible in the face of volatility risk. That's where Voltoro comes in. Voltoro is the leading gold hedging solution for the crypto community. And as a stable asset trusted for millennia, gold is the perfect long-term hedging solution. And at Epicenter, we've been using Voltoro since 2014 to protect a portion of our company's assets against volatility. Now you might ask, why not use a stable coin, Seb? Which is a great point, and don't get me wrong, stablecoins are great and a real benefit for crypto adoption. But algorithmic stablecoins are still a very new and experimental asset type, and some asset-backed stablecoins have been scrutinized for being under-reserved. With Voltoro, your gold is 100% insured and secured in vaults deep in the Swiss mountains protected by Brinks. Every single gram of gold is audited, and holdings are made transparently available on their website for anyone to verify. And most importantly, it's quite literally your gold. You can choose to have it delivered to you at any time. To learn more and to get access to Voltoro's brand new V2 platform, which includes an interface overhaul and trading in Dash, Litecoin, Ether, and Silver, go to voltoro.gold slash epicenter. That's V-A-U-L-T-O-R-O dot gold slash epicenter. We'd like to thank Voltoro for their support of the podcast. If I'm a, if I'm a validator and, and you're a validator, the current design is both of us will make the same money in a year if if our infrastructure has the same performance. That's right. Uh, what we saw that uh, when token price is going down, for some validators, it's not interesting to be validators anymore. So they step out and the reward per year, as you said, for, for, for the uh, arrest validators are increasing, right? Because... Uh, they have smaller uh, rounds, and they basically create more coins. So that's what we uh, that was, that's something that we observed at validators. Uh, some validators stepping out because the reward is not interesting for them anymore. But if in a system like this, if I am a validator, I would naturally want the validator set to be small, because the bigger the set grows, the more diluted we I get. Uh, there are some points, right? So, like, minimum number of validators for the governance is three validators, right? So, without, if, if you have less than three validators, then you cannot make governance decisions, right? You need at least two versus one, right? Like, two of three to, vo to vote for a governance decision. So, maximum number of validators, uh, let's say 3,000, right? It's, it's a limitation uh, uh, of uh, uh, state storage within the, uh, the current setting uh, that we have. Uh, with like the same as an Ethereum, right? The the optimal. What is the optimal number of validators? Like when when I asked this question myself, uh, uh, like what is the number? First, I looked into other chains. Uh, <laughs> EOS twenty one validator. Is it enough or not? <laughs> For example, and, and and also I looked into academic research. There is a paper uh, by uh, Emin Gun and uh, some other researchers uh, from Cornell called uh, decentralization in Bitcoin in Ethereum. And Ethereum, and uh, he had a, a claim within this paper that uh, number of validators, like more than twenty in a quorum type of system, is uh, I, I cannot uh, I, I repeat it uh, as it is. Uh, but basic idea is that uh, if you have twenty validators or more, uh, then this uh, like this is enough to to be like more decentralized than the current state of Bitcoin and Ethereum. So that that was my like. Uh, base point, okay, guys, we need to have uh, like 20 or more validators. So I told them, like, ideal number of validators, uh, when, when I bootstrapped the network, I told it would be great if we can have like 25 validators. 
uh, and they never reached 25. And now it's uh, 18 plus uh, Master of Ceremonies, like they, they validated without uh, voting rights. Um, yeah, that's uh, 19 validators. When X Day started, it was only one validator <laughs> because I didn't find a group of people who wanted to be validators on X Day because no incentive, no token, you know, no reward, nothing. You just have to run a node, pay money for it, and uh, people were not interested in running this network. And it was quite hard to add, uh, you know, first uh, first validators. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, based on my um, like uh, based on based on our experience with uh, uh, with with updates, uh, the validator set of uh, let's say twenty to like to twenty five uh, uh, people in, in uh, basically in different time zones uh, can upgrade the the protocol uh, within twenty four hours, which is uh, not not bad, right? So with, within twenty four hours, they can solve coordination problem to like to install like new. Uh, like to agree that they have to install new new software and install it on their servers, deploy it, and uh, confirm, and you know discuss again and wait, you know, and, <laughs> and all, all this stuff. So it's uh, it's it, it's it's quite good. Uh, with uh, like just imagine we have uh, thousands of validators. This coordination problem will be uh, much harder to, to to solve, right? Without automatic updates and uh, uh, and uh, you know all these uh, centralization points. There's also a token in this network, the POA token. So, what does th that token do? Uh, well, the uh, the the protocol was designed in 2017, right? So we uh, and we looked into how to make uh, Ethereum protocol more scalable. So we basically, copied the the idea of uh, of uh, of the Ethereum uh, utility of the token, uh, and basically, it's a uh, it's a it's a way to pay for gas uh, and. Um, also, uh, unit of account and medium of uh, of exchange on the network. That uh, that that was the basic uh, uh, promise of this token. Later on, we exchanged use case. Uh, we we added uh, we added uh, additional use cases. So the the interesting use case was with the uh, with the first bridge which we launched uh, on POE. So this native token uh, uh, we wrapped it into ERC twenty token uh, on mainnet, and this token. Um, uh, it was like the first uh, ERC20 token connected to coin payments, so it was possible to use it uh, uh, as a as a medium of exchange between, let's say, vendors and and clients. Also, it uh, can be lended on borrowed on uh, Ethland, swapped to other tokens on Uniswap, traded on in a, in a wrapped form or in native tokens on exchanges. So there's like arbitration and speculation features, which is also a part of any token economy. Right, and uh, and possibly will be some uh, staking uh, features if validators of POE uh, decide to, to to migrate to to, to our new delegated proof of stake consensus. Tell us about this uh, new delegated POS. Yeah, this delegated proof of stake is designed for um, uh, for 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 X Dive first. Uh, so the the one of the main question to to validators, uh, people think that this uh, structure is uh, centralized. I don't call it centralized; I call it exclusive. So like validators can decide um, um, who will be new validators, and we can see on the forum that validators uh, don't like some validators, right? Uh, and uh, reasons, for example, one obvious reason because a new validator don't know any other validators, right? So people don't trust him. That's uh, that's one of the uh, one of the problem. Like exclusiveness uh, of the protocol is something that can be uh, not not good in some situations. For example, in 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 in, in potential censorship problems, uh, when validator set is uh, small and exclusive, and uh, there are some you know orders. For example, to stop and not do whatever you do, uh, the this exclusive validator set uh, can break promises of fluidness of the network, right, of the consensus. That's one of the main reasons uh, to make uh, the public permissioned network with uh, uh, inclusive uh, access to to set of validators. So that's, um, that's, that's why we need um, uh, staking, because uh, anyone with a staking token can participate in, in, a, in a staking as a, as a candidate who can be uh, elected as a validator. Uh, and to, to bring... Uh, like reputational part uh, to this selection, uh, and also to select a subset of um, 
uh, of validators not only based on their own uh, stake but also by like public trust. We uh, added uh, uh, delegation to this uh, consensus, and this is that's why it's delegated proof of stake. Um, some people don't like delegated proof of stake ideas, especially after you know e EOS, and they think it's still centralized. So that, that we looked into problems with with EOS and uh, uh, and like what people uh, think that is centralized in EOS, and decided to to design it differently. For example, delegators in, in DPoS consensus uh, by PoE uh, are incentivized by the protocol. So they receive part of the uh, emission reward. They can get some fees from bridges and so forth. Uh, and EOS, they don't get any reward uh, from the protocol. And the reward they get is you know, under the table, basically. right? And also, the, um, how reward is distributed between validators and delegators is, is, is a bit different. Uh, all, val all, all validators uh, within the uh, validator set who are elected uh, to be validators uh, uh, for the staking epoch get equal reward, right? So no matter how many coins you have, you you, you will get equal reward um, for the for for this slot, right? Let's say if we have nineteen validators, like each validator will get one one nineteenth. Within uh, each of these one nineteenth validator has distribution between validator and all delegators who staked on this delegator. And this distribution is actually uh, uh, also fair. Uh, so delegators, when they delegate more on validator, they decrease rewards of the validator uh, and they compete between each other. Uh, but uh, we can imagine that uh, delegators will have so many coins that reward of the validator will be zero, right? Because the pressure uh, will be uh, pressure of coins delegated uh, on, on, on this validator will be too, uh, too big. So that's why we, we, we added uh, what we call saturation point. And below the saturation point, reward of validators cannot uh, get like below, right, of the saturation point. So in, like worst case scenario, each validator can be sure that they will get 30% out of one one nineteenth of the reward um, per per staking epoch. So that's something that we that we added uh, um, uh, for for fairness. Uh, and uh, also, I'd like to mention that the uh, the staking consensus uh, reward distribution, zebel control, all this uh, 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 consensus uh, related. Uh, parts of this protocol, but not BFT part, they, they all implemented in Solidity, which is uh, good for, for developers because they can, uh, let's say if someone is interested in taking this protocol and adapting it for their own side chains, they can take it and tinker with it. And you know, it's a high level language. It runs with an EVM, you know, like all advantages uh, of Solidity, access to developers, access to smart contract auditors, formal verification, which is very hard to get on uh, like protocol built on uh, uh, like low level, let's say. What's really fascinating about about POA is that you're like you know challenging conventional wisdom on many dimensions, and you have a protocol that that does many things that other protocol designers just wouldn't touch. Now, there are reasons why protocol designers wouldn't touch things like this, right? So, for example, this idea that you can have a minimum reward rate for the validator. It cannot go below 30% of 1 by 19. This is an issue that's being debated in the Cosmos ecosystem. Should, be a, should there be like a, a UBI for validators? Should there be like a basic income for all of these validators? The problem that prevents something like Cosmos from doing it is that the argument is if you give a UBI to all the validators, well, the validators will just promise the delegators, hey, delegate with me and I will give you part of my UBI as extra rewards outside the protocol. And so the UBI will not function as a UBI because the validators and the delegators can break the UBI outside the chain. Now, it, it feels like you haven't worried about a problem like that at all. And you will implement a UBI, UBI and we'll get to see the result of that. Right. And uh, the, this reward is uh, from, uh, uh, from, from only from, from staked tokens. There is no reward that, that 
they distribute between them as a as a like a reward per block, right? They they only distribute reward that they get from the from the tokens they stake, right? So there is a there is an emission rate, and they get reward based on this emission rate from the token they they staked, and people staked on top of them, right? So it's uh, there is no reward which is uh, created uh, like out of nothing each block, and after based on uh, some distribution you have to distribute it between uh, different parties. Also, this uh, uh, DPoS consensus uh, supporting multi-chain staking. So the staking token lives on uh, uh, on uh, on mainnet on Ethereum mainnet, and can be bridged to XDAI or can be bridged to another network with uh, the same emission curve, right, and uh, the same supply. So if I stake on XDAI one, I'll get uh, my reward on XDAI one, and I cannot stake on uh, XDAI two, right, because Bridge knows that I bridged my token to XDAI one, but if I see that there are too many uh, delegators on XDAI one, uh, or there is a uh, only one, or let's say only three validators uh, on uh, uh, on XDAI two, I can I can bridge my tokens to the next network, and uh, and, and delegate uh, on validators on the second network. I I took this concept from uh, MMO RPG. So if if you, if you ever played World of Warcraft, there are servers which are like uh, over uh, populated, and uh, you 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 have the same kind of uh, game setting, but it's you know more people. It means that you have to wait longer in lines, and uh, uh, some uh, some bosses are uh, you have to wait for their respawn. So you can move your character to uh, another uh, server using a bridge, right? And uh, on this server. You can uh, you know play with uh, all your all your items uh, and uh, get whatever you want from the game, but with uh, uh, with different uh, let's say economic terms, right? So that, uh, but it's kind of the same game. So that that's what we call multi-chain staking when people can uh, and also it solves our problem with uh, like what if we want to launch one more network? Like okay, today we 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 enjoy uh, XDAI, uh, but the same concept can work with uh, different. Um, uh, with different stable tokens, I'm very interested in Ampleforth, uh, which is a very uh, interesting concept, uh, and uh, some some other stable tokens. Like, can we launch one more network like uh, XDAI, but with different native token and, and the same staking token? So it's possible. So we've talked about XDAI for a while now. M maybe maybe we should uh, give a brief introduction of of what that actually is. Would you do that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, XDAI is uh, what we call the first ever uh, stable chain. So it's a it's a it's a new side chain uh, based on Ethereum protocol with uh, DAI as a as a native token. Uh, how to make DAI as a native token? We have a, a interoperability solution token bridge, and this token bridge uh, can bridge DAI from mainnet uh, to XDAI. So on on mainnet, uh, this bridge allows to lock and lock DAI. Right, and uh, on the XDAI side, this bridge allows to mint and burn the XDAI. So minting and burning of native tokens is something that uh, is unique uh, for for blockchains because usually uh, the emission curve is uh, is defined by the protocol, and external events cannot just you know send uh, to consensus messages. Okay, please print this amount of coins for this user. Right? That's something that we don't have usually in, in, in consensus algorithms for, 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 for native tokens. So with XDAI, each block is created with, uh, you know, with uh, like empty reward, like no reward at all. But when DAI is locked uh, on, on Ethereum side, the bridge can relay this event. And uh, this event is, uh, uh, is, a, is a command uh, to the consensus to, to mint new coins for a user who locked these coins on the Ethereum side. The market cap of XDAI is uh, like 20, 32,000 uh, DAI. So this amount of DAI is locked on the uh, uh, Ethereum mainnet side and uh, minted on XDAI side. Uh, that's um, something that uh, uh, gives very interesting perception when you use the network. Because if you have an account balance um, in DAI, it looks like you have an account balance in dollars. Right? And when time uh, passes, you have the same uh, account balances if you don't spend it. Uh, and it's something that is very convenient for us in real life, right? And it's very hard to get in, in, in cryptocurrencies. That's why this uh, um, 
a protocol. Um, we started to, to think how to use it in peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, payments. And there, there are some uh, very exciting developments around the protocol by the community. The most, most well-known well is uh, uh, Burner Wallet by, by Austin Griffith. Uh, and the uh, Poketo, which is a burner wallet implementation on uh, iOS and Android by the Poketo team, who like community uh, created this wallet. Uh, this the second big use case for for XDAI is uh, a platform for uh, smart contracts. It's interesting to um, to use it for for smart contract developers because they can um, they can understand how much will they pay. Uh, for for platform usage, right, and also they can give um, stable balances to their users, and they can calculate unit economy of their smart contracts, which is also uh, important for for many use cases. Like if you if you discuss uh, economy of uh, of a game with a game developer, they have calculation of lifetime value of a user, right, and uh, uh, how much they spend to, to get the user, how much they spent on uh, basically hosting the user, and what is the revenue of this game developer. And with uh, volatile tokens, like on Ethereum mainnet, it, uh, it's hard to predict right, what the price of Ethereum will be in a, in a year or in a day. So the POA and XDAI networks are not trustless, but they offer fast finality and low transaction costs. In some way, this limits the use cases uh, for the POA mechanism. So what, what are things that you think definitely should absolutely not run on POA? Uh, for, for me, it's interesting to, uh, to see any use case which can be run on the, uh, on the chain is, is interesting to see. And uh, the question that we don't know um, the answer for is uh, how the network will, um, will operate under uh, conditions of pressure, both on like validators and uh, like denial of service attacks, uh, which didn't happen uh, uh, much on, 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 on side chains. So for us, it's, uh, it's quite interesting to see the, uh, the all type of, uh, of applications deployed on the network, although we cannot uh, facilitate some of these uh, activities, right? Uh, we are working on um, uh, bringing private transactions uh, using uh, ZK Snarks. We're not developing Snarks ourselves, but we're helping other teams to bring mixers to PO and XDAI and to integrate these mixers into um, uh, some uh, wallets like Burner Wallet and Poketo. Uh, we have for this uh, ZK uh, privacy fund and uh, we already distributed 40,000 uh, DAI during the last two months and we plan to distribute 60,000 DAI more uh, and likely this, uh, this projects will bring uh, use cases, uh, which can be interesting, right, uh, for, for the uh, like censorship resistance and so forth. Uh, I mean that uh, um, public networks uh, should not be afraid of uh, specific use cases. If public network uh, can, can, can operate uh, with any use case, then it's truly public network. Cool. And what kind of applications are getting the most traction on the POA network and on XDAI? Yeah, with, uh, with POA, uh, now we are focusing on, uh, on, on uh, use cases with, uh, with games, uh, blockchain games. And uh, at the moment, the, if, if you open uh, State of the Dapps, uh, which is a ranking site uh, for, for platforms uh, with uh, smart contracts, the uh, game number one is called Geon. It's a geocaching game. Uh, it's it's based on POA network, right? So they decided to use it uh, because it uh, provides a temporary scalability solution, uh, and they don't need to rewrite their application to run it on a side chain. Uh, it's actually quite an interesting game uh, because it's uh, it's uh, it's not showing uh, uh, wallets and uh, tokens and balances uh, in tokens to users, uh, and they're getting traction. And after they they, they they will get enough traction with users. They will open this um, uh, token economy to people. Um, the the use case for for XDAI is uh, what we plan to uh, to focus on and uh, uh, facilitate is peer to peer payments. So integration with uh, more wallets. Uh, very exciting development with uh, with XDAI uh, is integration with uh, Discord. So XDAI is integrated with Discord tip uh, bot and it allows you know tipping and airdrops uh, and 
some form of uh, gambling, uh, like dice and, and so forth uh, within the chat, uh, which is quite cool to make in, in stable coins. And, and also we plan to support um, uh, XDAI in, in as many wallets as possible and, and facilitate uh, real world usage um, of, of this uh, uh, stable coin. So basically POA for games and XDAI for, uh, for payments. What do you hope to achieve in the next year or so with uh, POA and XDAI? The main achievement uh, for us uh, will be migration to delegated proof of stake. Uh, and the second part of this uh, migration is uh, migration to a new BFT consensus uh, protocol, which we're working on uh, for the uh, last year. It's called Honey Badger BFT. Uh, it's quite exciting because it's a uh, uh, asynchronous consensus uh, and uh, censorship resistant with uh, on chain randomness. Uh, 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 and uh, it's already implemented. We, uh, we made the security audits uh, for it and now integrating with uh, several partners uh, with uh, Luxo and Artis, we're integrating it into Parity Ethereum client. And when it's integrated, uh, we'll send upstream to, to Parity and uh, let other people to use this uh, exciting uh, uh, consensus algorithm. Uh, there are not many censorship resistant uh, consensuses uh, out there uh, and Honey Badger was quite hard to, to implement. Uh, we also uh, uh, had educational articles how the consensus is working and what are our extension to this consensus, like dynamic Honey Badger. Uh, because uh, Honey Badger itself is not uh, designed to, uh, to support some features which are important in the POA or DPOA settings. For example, it doesn't support dynamic validator set when we can you know, add or remove validators uh, from, the, uh, from the consensus. And that's something that we had to, to implement uh, on top of Honey Badger. So we have educational uh, materials uh, on our forum. Uh, it's, uh, this very uh, hard consensus is explaining it in, you know, it's a, in, in easy to understand language. Thank you for being on the show, Igor. That was super interesting. I'm excited to see where this project goes. Yeah, thank you very much for hosting me here. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.